Welcome to Korea and the World, a podcast on political, economic, and social issues from the perspective of the Korean Peninsula. On the 27th of July, 1953, the Korean War came to an end with the signature of the Korean Armistice Agreement. Designed to ensure a complete cessation of hostilities in Korea, the agreement effectively separated the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, the North, and the Republic of Korea, the South, by a 241-kilometer-long and approximately 4-kilometer-wide border. Ironically, this territory, called the Korean Demilitarized Zone, or DMZ, has become one of the most militarized borders in the world, with nearly 2 million soldiers patrolling on both sides. Only 55 kilometers away from Seoul, in the middle of the DMZ, lies the most famous border village, Panmunjom. Now a popular destination for tourists, the village hosts the Joint Security Area, where North and South meet. Along with the DMZ, the armistice also established mechanisms meant to regulate the relations between North and South Korea. Among them, the tasks of monitoring and regulating military buildup on the peninsula were delegated to the Neutral Nations Supervisory Commission, or NNSC. At the time of the armistice, both sides selected two countries each to form the Supervisory Commission. The United Nations Command chose Switzerland and Sweden, while North Korea and the Chinese Volunteers Army nominated Poland and Czechoslovakia. Officers from these countries were stationed on their respective sides of the border. Today, however, as a result of the fall of the Berlin Wall, only Sweden and Switzerland maintain permanent operations in the DMZ. What is the role of the NNSC in the 21st century? Do the two Koreas cooperate? And how is life inside the DMZ? To find out, we had the great honor and privilege of interviewing Major General Urs Gerber, head of the Swiss delegation to the NNSC. Major General Gerber first joined the Swiss Ministry of Defense as an intelligence officer. He was later in charge of the Armed Forces Security Cooperation with Euro-Atlantic States and rose to the rank of Deputy Director for International Relations. In his various capacities, Major General Gerber worked closely with counterparts from the UN, the OSCE, and NATO. He joined the NNSC as head of the Swiss delegation in 2012. Major General Urs Gerber, welcome to Korea and the World. Thank you for having me. How does one become the Swiss general in Panmunjom? That's a fairly good question because we have now 61 years that we are present here in Korea with, uh, with this delegation. Only the four or five first head of delegations were military people. And then up until 2008, it was only diplomats. They were simply put in a military uniform, in a general's uniform. And only since 2008, so I'm only the second in a row uh, as a military to come here uh, to take over. Which already indicates that our role is more military diplomatic than it's really military. So that's basically the framework. First period I worked for in, in, a, in the academic world as a research assistant in the Swiss National Fund. And then from then on I worked in different positions in uh, the general staff, in the Swiss general staff. And then uh, my last position before, before coming here was uh, I was the Deputy Director of International Relations in, uh, of our uh, Ministry and of the Armed Forces. We'll talk about the role of the NNSC and your role in particular maybe a bit later. Um, first, I'd like to focus on the Korean conflict as it is today. Everyone who has ever been to the DMZ knows that South Korean and North Korean soldiers stand eye to eye there. But is there a real standoff? Is this a real military situation? Or is it a bit for show nowadays? What's the real situation on the ground? Uh, to put it in a nutshell, it's, it's all about both of it. For sure, particularly for your home audience, and there is a big difference in the sense that the North Koreans don't have a home audience. That's also the fact, one of the facts that the North Koreans in the average look more relaxed than the South Koreans. In South Korea, you have a home audience, they see you, and then there are high expectations from the Blue House down to your military superior that you do your job not only correctly, but also that you impose yourself and that you show to the other side that at least as strong, if not stronger, uh, than the other side. So that's, there are several elements that give you the impression that there is this tension, which uh, is looks from close a little bit one-sided, which... I would not put in the same basket by saying that the North would not be ready and uh, that they would not uh, have more or less the same duties, the same tasks, the same feelings. But the behavior is, is slightly different. Eye to eye is only uh, in Pamujom, in the Joint Security Area, because that's the only area where they have the possibility to stand eye to eye. 
as you know, all the rest, all the 240 other kilometers, there should be, in theory, it should not be possible to see each other eye to eye because there should be a four kilometer distance be between the two eyes, which, as we all know, uh, is unfortunately only valid sort of in, in theory because there are quite many areas where they are closer to each other. Uh, last point, tension-wise. We're often asked, well, do you see, feel the tension? You don't see the tension. There is no physical tension visible, not in the DMZ and not in the uh, Joint Security. It's more, it's more, uh, it's more, it's in the air. And uh, that was particularly was particularly obvious during the this so-called Korea crisis of last uh, of last spring. But uh, if I would speak of today or of yesterday, it is calm and it is really, and I, I stress that it's business as usual. So you just mentioned that there there is a, maybe a flare up when there is a, a crisis between the two Koreas. How do you feel that on the ground, and how does the situation change, maybe militarily or in terms of posture? Well, you have to distinguish between uh, the DMZ or the, the units that are involved in DS, DMZ business. It is important, and I must really stress that, uh, which is very positive. Both sides there are uh, aware of the fact that if they would raise the tensions artificially there, that would have a major impact. So they keep this business as usual poster also during period of, of crisis or tensions. That does not necessarily apply for the units that are outside. The only problem is that we have no access, direct access to these units because it's not part of our mandate. And we might come back to that when then I uh, explain what our role is. Uh, so there is a sort of access, but it's not on a daily basis as we see it uh, in the DMZ or particularly in Panmunjom. Can you maybe give us an idea of the forces and presence? Is this a live conflict with a very sizable military presence or is it just show, so to speak? To have a full picture, you have to speak of the whole Korean Peninsula because uh, with modern technology, each and every corner of both countries may affect uh, the conflict. So we have to definitely go out of the DMZ. Now, the sheer fact in terms of, of, uh, of quantity that we have about a 2 to 1 superiority by the north of about two, uh, 1.2 million uh, soldiers under arms and the south roughly 650,000. That's most probably the highest densed military area on that planet. Because it's only 241 kilometers wide. Uh, there are borders between, let's say, Ukraine and, and, and Russia or any other, but then we speak of 1,000 plus kilometers. So it's it's almost comparable uh, to the last part of the, of the Cold War in, in Germany with this high uh, volume. And then uh, don't forget that 70% of the North Korean forces, which is quite understandable, are uh, deployed south of, of Pyongyang and to compare with also the South Korean forces are also the bigger part forward located because the war technically is still going on and you have to be ready in case of that one side might decide uh, to launch an attack. I think one question that we hear quite often in South Korea is should we be afraid of North Korea? Is North Korea a threat militarily? What is their presumed or effective readiness level? Well, you have a personal feeling, you have a feeling, and then you have to take into consideration other facts. If I would say, or if uh, responsible leading figures in the South Korean or the in American military uh, chain of command would say North Korea is not a threat anymore, that has an impact on the threat perception on both sides. And the fact that I pers personally, I do not feel threatened by the North Korean military, but this is due mainly due to the fact that deterrence works. Uh, deterrence in that sense means that the North Korean leadership particularly has most probably the perception that if they would launch a sizable military attack, that this would basically be the end of the system and of the current regime. That's what I mean on the deterrence. So that the price would definitely be too high to engage it. That's the classical military threat. There are other threats in the what's now uh, in the south is called the asymmetric 
uh, threats, and I think there there is much more potential. Can you maybe explain what those are? Well, that starts uh, very recently. One of the interesting, but also potentially very successful thing is cyber, because cyber does not in- include weapons. It is, in terms of escalation, uh, much better manageable than than if you engage weapons. You do not have direct casualties of people. So there are, let's call it, sort of advantages that you would go over there. But the nuisance potential, particularly for an economy like uh, the one of South Korea, is enormous. There is the NBC, the NBC area. I would not put uh, the nuclear uh, issue in, in the forefront, but there are other things to keep the others uh, on a high level of, of, of threat perception, which is equally important for the North as well uh, for the South. And last but not least, that's then more on the political threat perception, that's the nuclear and ballistic issue. I firmly believe uh, nuclear weapons uh, of, as of today are not primary military tools, but they're rather uh, the big hammer threat to say if you do it on a lower level, then we have at least the tool to escalate. And in the North Korean case, that they are now taken serious by the Americans, to put it very bluntly. And in the framework of recent developments on that planet with Libya, with Iraq, even with Ukraine, uh, you would come to a conclusion which sounds pretty uh, obvious that if you have these things, that puts you in a much better position to resist any pressure from outside. And if you give them up, you run the risk that at the end of the day you end up in a trench like uh, Muammar Gaddafi did. So that's that's an incentive to to keep it and even maybe uh, to develop it further. So you say that the US now may take North Korea more seriously because of this nuclear threat. Have you seen any changes on the ground or is it just purely in terms of political engagement? The political engagement of the United States in terms of of the nuclear question in Korea is not the one that I would mention as uh, as very strong. Uh, As you know, the attitude still is strategic patience, which basically includes, uh, well, we do not engage. Is that a real strategy or is that just no strategy? Well, it's not on me to to discuss the U.S. strategy. The only thing what I say is that you cannot expect from a a government that takes that as a strategy, whether it's one or not is another question, that they would be in the forefront of taking up the issue. Now, you see, it's not a force poster issue, but I think there are two things where you clearly have seen a change in, in the American threat perception. Apart from statements by top commanders, as for instance, General Scott Barotti, who was very openly stating that here in Korea as well as in the US. First is the pattern of exercises. So these uh, questions of asymmetric, non-conventional NBC issues get a high priority on, on each level. And secondly, it's deployment of new systems to prevent attacks on, North, uh, on South Korea. I mentioned uh, two things. First is, as you might remember, last year in, during the crisis where the US decided to move anti-ballistic missile systems from the East Coast into Alaska, which was a clear indication that they, they take it serious. And the second, which is now a big issue here in Korea, the American idea or basically the project to deploy THAAD into South Korea which basically, as it is designed, would be the response to any possible uh, nuclear ballistic attack on South Korea. So the major transition, of course, in North Korea in the last few years was the death of Kim Jong-il, and now Kim Jong-un is in power. Did you see any differences on the ground in terms of maybe how the military is organized, or is there any kind of leadership change? Can you feel the the change of power in in Panmunjom? You have to distinguish between Pan Munjom and perception that I have living here for almost three years in, in, in Korea. There are differences. In Pan Munjom, there is no difference. The only difference, to be very blunt, is that since this summer, they have more modern helmets and a little bit more modern uniforms. But that's not really a change. That's a thought of uh, thing that happened. However, it still indicates that 
the system is caring about this instrument and this instrument I think there is no doubt about that is important uh, for the current system as it was important uh, before and maybe even a little bit more important if you see uh, how often the young leader now visits military units and uh, you get the impression they want to take it more serious but that's the thing that you don't see in Palm Control the thing that you see a little bit from distance what has been changed however in the overall assessment Kim Jong-un is much better in public relations he basically runs in many in many domains he runs the show in what sense well South Korea, South Korean government particularly, is more on the reactive mode than on the proactive road. That depends on, uh, on different factors, which I would not like to, to dwell uh, too much upon. But the North Korean leadership is much more present. And the picture, what we get here in South Korea and, and indeed basically in the whole world, is fully dependent on what you get out of North Korea. So they run the PR show. And... When you compare with his father, it was gray and dark. And now it's, it's, it's colorful. Uh, sometimes uh, he doesn't look very, very happy. Uh, but then uh, two or three days later, you, uh, you see that uh, he exchanges a, a military commander. But on the other hand, then you see him in a, in a more positive mode. So he, he drives a little bit the PR agenda. And that's the thing that, that has certainly changed uh, in comparison uh, to his, his father, uh, reign before on whether the political agenda has really dramatically changed that's then yet another question let's talk now about the role of the nnsc in the dmz um, can you maybe first explain what the armistice entails what does it say about the nnsc what are the countries involved and what are some daily activities or tasks that you are involved in as you rightly mentioned the armistice is the key document in this framework the armistice agreement basically pausing the combat operations to create favorable conditions to come to a political solution uh, has not yet been uh, implemented in that sense, at least the second part of the intentions. The armistice agreement is the legal basis for the Neutral Nations Supervisory Commission. Uh, so basically that means uh, we depend on that, the tasks are formulated within this document and as long as this document is in force and our partners that have nominated us to do that uh, job, we do our job. It's as simple as that. If this document disappears, for whatever reason ever, we disappear as well. This Neutral Nations Supervisory Commission, consisting uh, initially of four uh, countries, two nominated by the South, two nominated by the North, being Switzerland and Sweden from the South, Poland and Czechoslovakia from the North, uh, have been created as an independent and impartial body, and I stress that, independent and impartial, to observe and supervise the correct implementation of this agreement. That the, was the initial task, and with some alterations is still uh, the task uh, today. So we are not subordinated or dependent from the United Nations Command, for instance, or for the KPA or the Military Armistice Commission, we are not even, we cannot be tasked by our government or military commanders back home. They have nothing to say. It is this commission must be totally independent. Unfortunately, since 1995, North Korea does not accept us anymore. We are considered to be a, a ghost or some, recently they called us even a monster organization. So our activities and indeed all activities in really implementing the armistice agreement is reduced to the southern side. Why did the northern side reject you, so to speak? It's pretty understandable. First, uh, no, I, I focus only on the NNSC. There are other issues in the framework of the armistice agreement, which I would not like to dwell upon. You had two nominated by the south, two nominated by the north. That, uh, Poland and Czechoslovakia, when nominated, were absolutely staunch supporters of the Soviet system, fully integrated in the Soviet Empire, hence ideologically clear an ally of North Korea. Now, uh, in 89, both countries changed sides, and particularly when then 91, the Soviet Union and the Soviet Empire definitely broke, North Korea had basically their allies moved in the other camp. So, instead of having two ideologically two, two, two against two, 
it's now zero against four. And from a North Korean perspective, I, full, I pretty understand that they say we do not want to cooperate and get judgments on our activities by an organization that is basically hostile. In that sense, it makes sense, even though North Korea indirectly profits to the extent that we do our job pretty uh, strict in the South and hence have an impact that the Southern for forces at least do not go over into a more aggressive mode. But this is only indirectly, it's not a direct uh, benefit that they would take out of it. So can you maybe talk a little bit about your activities and the daily tasks that you are involved right. in? What is the typical day of the NNSC officer? Before going into typical day, I have to stress that between 1956 and uh, 2010, the task was heavily symbolic and maybe for the individual officer a little bit boring. Because you had to sit in Pamunjom, that was your area of activity. Whoever that has been there knows that that's a tiny small uh, place. And you do then symbolic activities like uh, having formal meetings with a clearly set agenda that's only one-sided and you receive uh, delegations uh, to do a sort of outreach uh, program but that was it about since 2010 we do much more operational activities in the sense that with different so-called expanded tasks we observe deployments activities exercises and the like of the units deployed in the DMZ, but also particularly also deployed outside the, the DMZ. The objective is that we observe on whether their activities are in the spirit of the armistice agreement, because the armistice agreement only applies for the DMZ. And with these activities, we are currently running <laughs> slightly short of resources, because in a normal day, I would say two officers of, out of the five are taken by these expanded tasks. It can be education, it can be uh, inspection in the DMZ, it can be uh, exercise observations, and there are days where, and we will always have to have at least one officer being present in, present in, in Palmo John. So when I say before 2010, I assume, because I only came 2012, uh, I assume the bulk of the people were sitting in Pamujom. Now the bulk of the people are on road or in garrisons or on observation posts. So that's that's uh, basically the, the big difference. So how do you define whether um, something carried on by the South Korean military is compatible with the spirit of the armistice? Are there any requirements or regulations that you can enforce? Or what are the benchmarks? First of all, and that's extremely important, we cannot enforce anything. We do not have an executive mandate. So whenever we do that in the spirit of, we are invited or we are requested to do something. For sure, we can, from time to time, we push a little bit and say, well, would it, would it not be in, your, in the interest of your organization to do that? But we cannot enforce ourselves. Secondly, apart from exercise observations, there we act on our own. But all the other activities, be it education, be it particularly DMZ inspections or special investigations, it's always this, uh, the Armistice Commission, the Southern Armistice Commission that runs the operation. And basically our job is to check the checkers. It's not us to do it. Even though at the end of, of the activity, we write our own report, we come to conclusions or recommendations most of the time they concur, but quite often we do not concur. We come to different recommendations or we come to a different conclusion in terms of whether that has been a violation of the armistice agreement or not. And so this report is adopted by the, the Security Council? No, no. Well, basically the flow, the flow is, is as, as follows. We report that to the head of, of the uh, Armistice Commission. Normally, all these reports are then compiled to an annual report of command of the United Nations Command to the UN Security Council, yes, but compiled. Mm. So not each and every issue uh, is being taken up. The only thing that is put in the annex and uh, basically full text with, with a signature is our reports on, on the exercises. You mentioned 
that there are sometimes disagreements. Can we ask for examples or is that fully confidential? Well, it's partly confidential. The problem is you have regulations. Each side, each commanding officer on both sides can, can implement regulations. And sometimes these regulations are not up to date or they have loopholes. Uh, for instance, I'll give you, I'll give you uh, an, uh, an example. You get aware through an ex inspection that the forces are using a weapon system or um, an installation that is not covered by a regulation and it's then not taken up by the Armistice Commission because it's a sort of agreement or understanding that these things in the spirit would fit into Armistice Agreement. And then that we say, no, they have no basis, whether in the Armistice Agreement or in a regulation. Hence, the Armistice Commission said or says it is not a violation of the Armistice Agreement. And then we say it is a violation of the Armistice Agreement because it has no legal or military basis that this system is being used or is in existence. That might be a, an example that happened in, in the past uh, pretty frequent. It is a difficult question to ask, but how useful is the NNSC? Do you think the NSC fulfills a very important role in terms of monitoring and maybe documenting the situation? Or is it a slowly becoming a relic of the past? I'm biased on that question, <laughs> as you might know, uh, because I, I get my salary from that job. Uh, no, I think, to be very frank, the relevance has never been so important as now, because this in the spirit issue gave us, amongst others, access to the DMZ before we, as I told you, we were basically locked into uh, the Joint Security Area and Panmujom. Now, through these observations of the checkers, we get access to the full DMZ, which gives us then a real sense of how the situation in the framework of the Armistice Agreement is. That's point number one. With our constant presence, along the lines of four eyes see more than two. Uh, and if the, the first two eyes do not want or sometimes miss one thing, then the, the other two can say, have you seen that one? Is that something that we should take up? That creates a sort of second, third opinion, which has an impact on the governing process of implementing the armistice agreement. And as I told you, we do that only since 2010. So the, the pure symbolic part of it, which we still do, there, okay, its presence, it it's indicates to everybody, the Southern Alliance as well as to North Korea, that at least the South still accepts uh, the armistice agreement as being in force, also the international community. This presence is important it's in itself. But with it, on top of new tasks, we have... a. Not direct, as I said, because we do not manage or we run, don't run it, but we can have uh, an impact on the correct implementation, which is particularly important since North Korea has officially declared at, at that uh, the armistice agreement is null and void. So in that sense, I would say we are not only in terms of, of relevance, but also in terms of acceptance. And I would particularly also include the Republic of Korea and its military that we have a sort of all-time high. We had periods in the 50s where they wanted to get us out as soon as possible. We were even shooting at NSC officers. So I think over time it's recognized by the United States, by, uh, the, by South Korea, but also by all these um, member or participa participating states of United Nations Command that this sort of independent and impartial body is, is small but it adds to legitimacy and credibility. Do you think the Korean public is well aware of the role of the NNSC, or at least, to be a bit mean, maybe of the existence of the NNSC? And do you see any consequences uh, on your daily work if the perception is good or the perception is bad? I would say, well, the first, the first statement is still quite many people do not know what we are, who we are, and uh, I have to extend that. Quite many people do not know the armistice setting. Some do not know it because they don't want to know it, and some do not know it because for, the, for them it's painful, given that Korea is still a, a divided country. So there are different reasons. 
each and everybody that takes the step to get to know a little bit more is very eager to hear. So there is a positive attitude, a positive spin on getting on getting that message. And our position here is pretty positive. Uh, we had particularly also from the Korean side around the 60 years anniversary, there were, were two uh, documentaries on KBS for a prime time documentaries, which uh, uh, then at least those people that have seen it gave them uh, a positive mood and I'm addressed by people. So the guy who to whom I pay my fee for, for the car washing, since then he salutes me when, when I drive in and I, I do not wear the uniform, so he knows me. Well, that's an individual, but at least there are efforts, particularly also out of the Korean uh, armed forces, to make not only the armistice as a whole, but also the the NNSE's role a little bit more popular amongst uh, the population. Let's maybe transition to uh, North Korea. You already mentioned that uh, communication with them is difficult to say the least. Can you maybe give us a sense of your daily work when it comes to North Korea? Is it absolutely nothing to do with North Korea anymore or do you still try to somehow keep that link going? How, how does that work? As far as the NNSE as a commission is concerned, there is zero. Well, it's not because we do not want but they clearly indicated over time and several times, just recently when they called us monster organization, for them, they do not want to communicate with us in any sense. That does not mean that the countries, particularly Sweden and Switzerland, are not well respected. But as I told you, we are a commission. We are delinked from, from the countries. So whenever there are attempts, direct or indirect attempts, by both governments in Stockholm and Bern to bring the NNSE sort of on, on the political agenda, to remind them that there might be also some benefits that I already mentioned. But it's certainly not us. That is then a political process which goes on the bilateral way. When there are military exercises between the United States and South Korea, it usually has a direct impact on how North Korea behaves or at least reacts. Does that also have an impact on your daily job? Do you see maybe more uh, tension coming from North Korea or is there still yet again absolutely no communication whatsoever? There is no communication whatsoever, at least for us or with us. If there is communication, then it's normally it's done by KCNA uh, mainly because even at the, at the DMZ, there is a, as a rule on the so-called armistice communication line. It's an absolute one-sided communication. So it's only the South that communicates uh, to the North. And if the South does it, it must be an American to do it because the North Koreans do not speak to South Koreans on, on armistice against the background that in their view, South Korea has not signed the armistice agreement. Hence, they are another party to, to, uh, to the agreement. So there is... In the DMZ, anyway, in, in the joint security area, there is no change on whether it's it's exercise or not exercise. It's more than on a political level. It's more on readiness. It's it's uh, in the air. It's psychologically. And I assume that we will have in sort of February, early March, the annual rhythm will come up and uh, there will be allegations and things from the north and then uh, tensions will definitely go up a little bit more it doesn't necessarily mean that they will go up as they did in, in 2013 because in if you compare 14 with 13 that was already quite a big uh, big difference but that's the cycle that's the tension cycle which has a certain certain routine which does not mean that it is predictable i always say north korea is very predictable in their unpredictability and they do that quite clever i have to say so as an NSC officer, as, as I think our listeners now understood, you spend most of your time in Panmunjom. Can you maybe give us a sense of how life is on the, on the front line, so to speak? Do you have any anecdotes from daily life that you, you would like to share? I would not say it's boring. It's, it's a, a pretty routine job. It's a, a beautiful environment, I have to say so. Maybe not now when it's cold and gray and brown, but in spring, summer and fall, it's, life is much nicer than here in in downtown Seoul, the air is better, visibility is better, uh, it's much, uh, there is not that much noise, there is no traffic. So the environment as, as a such, if you would deduce all the 
with the barbed wire and all the strict and sometimes strange protocol. I call that the protocol because both sides go along the protocol. So it's more or less agreed still uh, how to proceed. It's, uh, it's pretty, well, it's, it's pretty nice, but that's exactly only one side of the coin. I live and sleep at about 70 meters from the MDL. My uh, office is about 20 to 30 meters from the MDL. Some people, uh, particularly Koreans, they would never dare to spend only one night there. That's too close to the uh, enemy. So for us, it's it's pretty it's pretty easy. Uh, it's routine. There are two things where tensions spark up immediately, and when you even sense it sometimes in in the DMZ. One is balloons. These balloon launching issues then uh, the Norse gets terribly nervous. And secondly, now we are in that time, it's Christmas trees. Christmas trees. <laughs> yes. So those are the two that uh, are definitely two things that Im have an in the immediate impact at the DMZ because normally the launching sites or the construction sites are, are close to the DMZ. So that's, uh, I would say, uh, that's uh, the issue. Second, just recently, it was a little bit unpleasant first part of October when we had a first in the West Sea that's far away but when we had pretty close to our camp twice warning shots being shot and in one case where the North Koreans shot back uh, then it's we do not feel threatened but it's in terms of a process this is very bad because the rules are so clear uh, in the West Sea there is a disputed line okay that can that can happen but there each and every square inch is clear, and uh, the rules the rules are basically uh, pretty clear. And to end up that, just a, a nice story we had at end of October. As you know, one of these blue barracks are used on a first come first serve basis for for tourists. And on that day, a group from the south, one of the individuals on that uh, tour, uh, forgot or lost or whatever his purse. That was sort of. 10 in the morning, I assume. And on the same day, this purse has uh, was given back by the North to the South. That means that's a process. So the KPA handed it over to the North Korean uh, Red Cross. The North Korean Red Cross, because it's a civilian line, there is a, the rules are, are less strict, indicated then through their hotline, also in Panmunjom, uh, to the South Korean Red Cross, that they would have this uh, purse and that in the afternoon that they would like to give it back. And then normally for these kinds of activities, civilian start of negotiation processes and uh, civilian uh, exchange and whatever, these always happen in our barracks. So then the South asked us, would you agree that we use this, uh, uh, your building? And then uh, exactly 4.30, both sides went into the barrack, they handed over this purse and uh, has been uh, able to uh, hand it back uh, to the owner on the same day. Also, this is possible. There is non-communication, but in certain areas, as long as it's not too political and not too military, then quite some things are possible. Particularly when, you, when there is a financial benefit in it, then there is much more pragmatism and sometimes even flexibility. But the political military agenda, that's concrete. Then you are knocking at, at the wall. Maybe to conclude, General Gerber, what would be the military implications of a collapse of North Korea or maybe a reunification of the peninsula? What would be, what would be the military implications? Uh, we have heard from some observers that there is a risk of unrest as the North Korean army could maybe collapse and end up in marauding groups. So what is, what is, you know, the, the, what is your scenario in, in, if that would happen? That's a $1 million question. I think... It's nice that you do contingency planning. That's absolutely necessary. But in that case, as in many other cases, no scenario will happen. It will be definitely difficult. I just had a, a discussion over lunch on German and Korean unification. Uh, and one thing is clear from all experience. You cannot plan a unification and you cannot make a unification. A unification takes place. So, in, a, in the Korean uh, context, first of all, an implosion or a collapse of the regime is on the scale of delicate 
uh, development is one of the worst. It has, it has only one advantage, it might happen tomorrow. A peaceful unification without any use of, of force is a process that takes quite a long time. The collapse, particularly now, given the more or less accepted fact that North Korea is sort of nuclear capable, runs then the risk, who looks after the nukes? Is it the Chinese? Is it the South Koreans? Is it the Americans? Is there a sort of agreement? Is there no agreement? So there are so many open questions in that scenario that, that uh, this is one of the most difficult issues. And I would not support, personally, I would not support anybody who would say we should go for that scenario and we should push for that scenario. Particularly keeping in mind that three out of five P5 members are actors and have national interests in that area. So the blocking element on a UN level to get to new UN Security Council resolutions in solving that issue is already pretty, pretty difficult. So that's, that's an issue. It is clear, however, on the other hand, that uh, from an outside perspective, uh, in military or crisis management environments, you have to take that into consideration. I have no access to uh, current plannings, but I know that this issue is now heavenly discussed, and that, but I do not know on whether you have the golden solution that you would be able then to solve that issue. Do you think the, um, the powers or the role of the NNSC could be maybe expanded in, in such a situation that the NNSC would be asked to maybe supervise disarmament or maybe asked to perform such tasks? Here it's clear. The NNSC immediately loses its mission and tasks as soon as the armistice agreement is off the table. Peacefully or violently, doesn't matter. So knowledge and experience out of those that belong to NNSC might envisaged to be used. But it will definitely not be NSC. Because NNSC is invariably bound to the armistice agreement. And here we don't speak of armistice. This is then a new situation. I could imagine that some people, as we have now 61 years of experience, in that, in that context, that this experience and this, uh, this, these skills can be taken out. But then there must be a new setting. Major General Gerber, thank you so much for being our guest today. Thank you very much for having me. This was Korea and the World. To make sure you don't miss our next episode, bookmark our website, koreaandtheworld.org, subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, and follow us on Facebook and Twitter.